Great. Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders podcast with Michael F. Schein, who is the author of the Hype Handbook and the founder of Microfame Media. Michael, I am a fan of your book uh, and um, reached out uh, because you are um, really an opinion leader of what it takes to create uh, momentum for a good cause. And, you know, I know hype is a strong and sometimes loaded word in the marketing language, but what your book does is, is, you know, tells great set of stories from innovators in uh, business, but also innovators in media and culture in religion and how they've used uh, certain skills and techniques to uh, tell really compelling stories to move audiences towards their ideas. And, you know, in our podcast, we obviously are thrilled to uh, take in, you know, great innovations from across various sectors and medias and, and mediums and uh, apply them to, you know, how do you move the important and challenging ideas forward? So I'd love to, you know, tell you, tell us a little bit more about yourself, your, your backstory, and we'll dig into the, the book and what you're building with your agency. Uh, a bit after that. So uh, tell us the Michael F. Shine story, please. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you for the very kind words, especially about the book. I, I was a writer before I was anything else. In fact, I never wanted to go into business. I happen to like being in business now, but it was the opposite of what I wanted to do. It struck me as very boring. Um, I wanted to be a novelist for a long time, and then I got really interested in music but more or less the songwriting and performance aspect, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I really thought of myself as as creative. And I think back then, you know, I always like to say to people the same, you know, when I was a kid, be, everyone was starting bands. Now all the young kids are starting startups. But but back then, I don't think business was seen as as a mechanism for being creative. It was seen as what, what your dad did, you know, something that people did, they went to work. So, um, yeah, I, I guess the short story is that that path, in a way, took me to where I am, because when I graduated college, I shocked and dismayed my parents by telling them that I was going to go to New York and change rock, rock and the band. We're not pleased. I went to the city of Pennsylvania, which they were proud of me about. So that wasn't really what they thought was going to come out of that. But I, By the but way, I did that. Here, here's a Quaker and alum. I, uh, Quaker alum, yeah. very, uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I was very, I was a Wharton and uh, and, and international relations uh, major, but I was very jealous of all the English uh, majors and and the right creative work that you guys were doing. So I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I was, I'm very proud of what you've done as well. <laughs> well, I was jealous of the Wharton people because I was, as as I saw it, going to graduate and uh, get a job for very little money if I got one. And the Wharton people were going to be rich at 22. So that was how I saw it at the time. Um, but but it just wasn't for me. Um, excuse me, allergy season. <laughs> so anyway, but, I, I, you know, even worse, I mean, I went and I started a band and and um, everyone was like, what are you doing with your life? And, you know, the, the, the end of that story was we didn't get famous, but I think we did better than anyone ever expected, considering that I'm not a very good guitar player. And that's not me being humble, but I, I, I got together with guys who were who were better than me and we were very theatrical. And we used to always say that we would hype up the shows. So, right. for example we talked our way on to showtime at the Apollo because we knew we would be booed off and that that would get us attention. Right. So long story short, that ended and I got a corporate job and I started to do well there. But after I had learned it all, I became an adult. I became a business person. But by year eight, I, I had a pretty good position there and was making nice money, but I hated it. I was, I was very bored. I just didn't see what I was doing with, with my skills. So I left to become a, a, a freelance copywriter, you know, someone who wrote marketing copy. And I figured because I'm a good writer that I would do well with that. And the people who did hire me liked me, but I could not get business. I mean, ironically, I had no idea how to market or sell. And I was a real student. I mean, I, I took courses, I took online mm -hmm. courses, I took offline courses, but I couldn't crack it. I learned search engine optimization and early social media and funnels and 
I, I was just like losing all my money and, and I was ready to get a job. And then I walked past the club that we used to have a residency at. And I remembered how good I was back then at, at marketing, but we never thought of it as marketing because we looked at rock managers and our favorite rock stars and, and, you know, cult leaders and things like that, people we were interested in. So I said, what if I took that approach? What if I started not marketing myself, but hyping myself? And I did that. And since I've been talking for a while, I won't tell you exactly what we did. But from there, it was a very short line to having a successful copywriting practice that turned into an agency that turned into the book. Um, and I became a business person. I run I run my own company helping other people sort of use that method to to draw attention to themselves and accomplish you know their goals that's a, that's an amazing story and uh i could connect on a couple levels um one that that's sort of really interesting that you did find your your way to creative and really uber creative uh way to to help folks because you're inspiring creativity in the others as well as your playbooks um and I, I think there's something to that about, you know, and it sort of comes out in your book about going back to some things that are authentically you, right, in your in your journey as kind of sources for how do you stand out, what makes you different. Uh, and actually, one of the um, uh, things that I've, um, I've noted about your book that kind of really resonated with me when I, I asked, started questions, well, what was, what was my journey? Like, what drew me as a kid? Um to kind of go and you know start become an entrepreneur and and you know kind of do ambitious things and um i started doing an inventory of what i read and what was paying attention to i was growing growing up in in ussr in ukraine and i started um uh realizing that i probably read every book written by jules verne who is a science fiction huh. writer interesting and and uh, and then like all of a sudden, oh, that makes sense. When I was 30, I did this around the world trip in like, you know, an amount of days. And, very cool. And I was like always inspired by, by you know, folks that are taking these ambitious projects. And our mission is, you know, to uh, uh, relate to the company I started to unleash ideas. And, and so it sort of fits into, uh, you, you know, surprising elements, right? Because it's not, you know, I, I think there's a, you know, when you do start working on your project, right? Like there is a, you probably know a pain that is very real for you for right. yourself, but it actually goes back to the roots of who you are, what your shape, how are you rebelling against your parents, and and maybe that's a plug for the Rolling Stones story because huh. I think that's one of my favorite ones from the book. You know, like um, on how they position themselves. Oh, uh, you mean uh, the, the the Andrew Lou Goldham the yeah. What, where? Well, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, even before I get into that, and I, and I will get into that, I want to say that. Um, I think that is important. I mean, the business that I kind of fell into between the band and what I do now was a business that ran contact centers. So customer service call centers for worked for very big companies. They're very, very, when I was there, they were large. Now they're gigantic. And um, I did well there, you know, I mean, I, I, I did a good job and I worked hard and I climbed the ranks and all this, but it really, I remember I got a raise and a bonus on the same day because I solved a big problem and worked around the clock for like three months. And I met my girlfriend at the time for dinner. And I said in this depressed voice, I got a raise and a bonus. And she's like, that's great. And I'm like, I'm the biggest loser in the world. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, because like, this is the opposite of what I ever wanted to do. And now it's going to be that much harder to leave. Whereas now, even though I'm not a rock star or a novelist, as my living, I love what I do every day because it comes out of my personality traits and, 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 and my sort of, you know, way of being in the world. So I will tell the stone story, but I wanted to say, I, I absolutely agree and relate to what you just said. Yeah. Well, let, yeah. Just to double click on that. It, it feels like, um, you know, whatever we're doing, right? And so like some people are in the, in the corporate role, they do have family obligations and other things, but there, there's, yeah. there's, they have to do some things, but in that role, whatever they are, it is, I think, critical, especially for many people that go into fields like marketing and communications that we're drawn to be creating, drawn to connect with people, you know, to 
unlo- unleash themselves a little bit to those original instincts, right? Because I like I focus a lot on B two B marketers, and you know they are they wanted to be storytellers and they wanted to be creators of visual um, experiences, and you know you know we see them in in my startup. We see that they're like stuck doing same old stuff that's been done twenty years, and right, and they feel locked into that. And I think it's you know it's up to us, right, as as uh, individuals to you know find what you know inspired what inspires us. Find people like yourself that kind of make us think differently. Find new tools that unlock uh, our limitations as creatives, as communicators. And so I think that's it. and some of those roots kind of you need to all go back and ask what what really makes me what makes what made me tick when I was thirteen or twelve or. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, at that age, right? No, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that corporation, most of us work for other people. I worked for other people for a long time. Most of us work in corporations. And I think corporations, there's nothing, I mean, inherently, that can be a wonderful vehicle for having an amazing career. Um, I think when there, it was more that I fell into what I was doing, you know what mm-hmm. I mean, without really mm-hmm. making a conscious choice. And then when I did try to make it my own, and I worked with some wonderful people, but there was a way of doing things. Do you know what I mean? Like, like there wasn't a lot of room in that environment because it really is an environment that does things a certain way, and it's like an arbitrage opportunity between what you're paying out, you know, what you're paying people, yeah. and and what you're bringing in, whatever. Um, I just realized that th- there was no room for me to do that there. And it wasn't what I had originally set out to do. And I didn't want to start my own business. In fact, I looked originally, I was going to try to get a job in a, a creative agency. This was many years ago, but I couldn't because I didn't have a book, which is what they call a portfolio, because I had been in the call center wor- world for the mm-hmm. last 10 years. So I had to create my own. Right. So that was but um, but I agree. I think um, there's a lot of opportunity in a lot of companies to do that for yourself. So um, should I tell that stone? So, let's go to the stone yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like I, the audience is is standing yeah. on their and their tiptoes. Well, this is almost in some ways the opposite of being your authentic self, but actually like twisting reality. So, you know, things aren't black and white. But um, the Rolling Stones when they started, it's very ironic because the Beatles were working class guys. And when they started out, they wore leather jackets and they were like greasers, you know? And they um they ate on stage, they smoked on stage, they cursed on stage. And um their manager who saw them play was this guy Brian Epstein and um I didn't talk about this part in the book, but um he thought they were great. He saw how excited the kids were. He was from a wealthy family and what he did was he put them in suits and told them to bow after every song and stop smoking on stage and all of that stuff and he basically took the energy of a working class rock and roll band and polished them up for general consumption so that was the Beatles magic so one of the guys who worked for Brian Epstein was this young kid really a teenager 1918 named Andrew Luke Oldham and he learned sort of that that hype promotion thing. And then he saw a band one night uh, that was a blues band, and they were called the Rolling Stones. Now, the funny thing about the Rolling Stones is that Mick Jagger, the singer, was very much middle class. His dad introduced basketball to um, the United Kingdom. And there's old videos you can see. He used to go on television, and you can see a little kid Mick Jagger like in part of his like films. It's really funny if you look it up. But and he went to London School of Economics, which is like Wharton in Britain. Um, and they grew up in London. They they were they you know Liverpool is like Pittsburgh. You know what I mean? And right. London is like New York, right? So um, you know they just got up and they played. And Andrew Lou Goldham said, you know, there's already a Beatles. We need an anti-Beatles. You know, the parents used to hate rock and roll, but now they like the Beatles. They think they're charming. What if we did, what if, what if we made a villain to the Beatles, good guys, a band everyone could hate? So he told these middle class kids, you know what I mean? He said, you know, leave your jackets at home, show up to interviews in the clothing that you slept in, slouch, you know what I mean? And that sort of thing. And so they became every parent's nightmare. And the funny thing is they started to live up to the role. So like, you know, Mick Jagger became a note and Keith Richards became a notorious 
bad boys with drug problems and this and that, but they were almost, they were pretending to be something to fill yeah. a role and then matching it. So I guess, I, I guess the lesson there, there's a lot of lessons there, but in, in regard to this is sometimes a little bit of theater is important. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know that they needed to go as far as they did in their personal lives. There were some health problems that occurred and some problems with the law, <laughs> depending on how you feel about that. But, um, you know, I, I think that understanding that perception and reality, that you can play with people's perceptions, right? And 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 there can be some playfulness and some fun in that. I mean, the Rolling Stones... You can say they were liars, but they weren't liars. They delivered a lot of pleasure to a lot of people by well, well they certainly that, became that committed. They certainly became well, committed yeah, to their. They bad became boy those people. Role. Yeah, yeah. It's well, funny because you read of, stories. This that yeah. they, they, they they this is just like the music nerd in me. The Beatles did such crazy things behind the scenes during the height of their bad boy, you know, of their good boy image, and they would invite the journalists to partake in certain. Um, debaucheries with them so the journalists would never tell on them you know what i mean they would never report that because they wanted to control that image where if the stones did one bad thing the manager yeah. would promote it everywhere well so this is really interesting example and i think you know back to what are some situations where some of the tools in your playbook could could be used so this is sort of a up-and-coming uh company right sort of challenging the market leader, right? And they're not going to go head to head. They need to, to either appeal to a different audience or to a different, um, uh, to different um, kind of persona that, um, you know, is, is kind of in need of whatever it is that they're, they're offering. Have you seen the examples in modern day uh, world, whether it's technology companies or other folks selling something innovative, bring something innovative to market where they're kind of carving out uh, the the positioning for themselves based on what's already in the market. Yeah, I, you know, as you were talking, a pretty perfect example comes to mind, uh, and you can tell me what you think about this. But let's consider Salesforce, the Beatles, right? So Salesforce created a whole new market segment, right? Before Salesforce, there was no cloud based CRM. Their their only competitor was Act, which you had to install on your computer, which is now completely obsolete. So Salesforce invented something that solved a very major problem. You know, you used to have to you'd, you'd spend you know, gosh, ten years building an online Rolodex, not online, a Rolodex on your computer, and then when you moved to a new operating system, the whole thing got erased. You you couldn't bring it over, right? So so that changed. And so they're dominant. They they have skyscrapers with their name on it in a very short period of time. They're a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar company, the whole thing. So now there's a company called Basecamp who also has mm -hmm. CRM software. So they could have done what all the other Liverpool and London bands did. They could have competed directly with Salesforce. They could have said, we're just as good as Salesforce. We're just new. And that's what Jerry and the Pacemakers did. That's what all of these bands that you hardly even remember anymore mm -hmm. did, right? But instead, they took the Rolling Stones approach. They said, there's already a sales force. The sales force is the gorilla. The sales force has everything. Sales force is complicated. Sales force has 300 different things you can do on it. You need a consultant to help you with sales force because it's so robust. But what the guys in Salesforce did, Jason Fried in particular, is he's constantly blogging and writing books and making videos on how work is too complex. He says, if you have a team that's regularly working weekends, you should punish them because they're yeah. not efficient enough. And you don't have right. good systems. That is not- So you're basically- and Yeah. So, and so, you're, you're, yeah. yeah. so well, I just want to finish. So what he did there- was he became, instead of saying we're better than Salesforce, he said, we are for simplicity and work. Guess what? Their tool only does five things. They're com they, they do what Salesforce does, but they're a completely stripped down version. And they took what could have been a negative and turned it into a complete positive. So I use Basecamp because I don't yeah. need all that crazy stuff. I'm a Rolling Stones fan. Yeah. They're the anti-Salesforce. They're not well, for everybody. I I love it. I love the story. So I, I have uh, insider knowledge on this a little bit. Do so you? Okay. I, I, I was the um, 
uh, the, Salesforce was still a unlisted, you know, an unlisted private company uh, when I was um, attending Stanford Business School for my MBA. Uh, as if Wharton wasn't enough, you know, I had to. Yeah, I know. Get, get, that's the yeah. one <laughs> undergrad school that basically yeah. is an MBA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was that was the fun. Uh, it was the fun version of that. But the, um, you know, I and I found uh, Salesforce because I was, was I was loving tech. I found them. I kind of, you know, created an internship for myself there and started oh, wow. consulting. And I so I ended up uh, working there. Uh, from before the IPO through the IPO to a bit after the IPO, I really picked the right example here. God. It was a gr- so yeah. you kind of you couldn't have picked a better one. Yeah. And here's the interesting story. So, uh, which supports your thesis actually is that Salesforce itself at that time was not you know the the behemoth that we know right. of, right? Like you kind of you started telling X story, and they actually picked a a, a fight with Siebel, right? And they <laughs> yeah, great so point. Their yeah. enemy was Siebel, and Siebel was the complex uh, kind of mega mega monster, sort of so to speak, of at the traditional enterprise software. And you know, Siebel got acquired by Oracle, and you know, it had that um, you know that same DNA. And the Salesforce positioning was, uh, you know, the you know we're easy to use. You could sign up. You don't need to have a huge team. You could start. Uh, that back at the time they had a personal CRM, kind of a competitor to Act, and so it was sort of the the original product led growth strategy was was them. But now they've of course evolved because they you know every enterprise software company eventually realizes that the bigger you want to grow, the more ambitious you are, the so more you need to become. That's where Basecamp. That's where Basecamp does a really unique thing because Salesforce, while they picked a fight. And this is getting into the weeds. And you, since you were there, you can tell me if I'm I'm wrong. But they did what every company does. When their biggest clients say, we need this and this functionality, they just add it. What the guys at Basecamp does, Jason Fried, they markedly say, when your clients tell you to add features, say to them, thank you very much, but no, go somewhere else. Yeah. And so as a result, they've made small, they've, they've burned their boats. They've basically said, we're always going to be the simple tool yeah and we will turn people down you know what i mean and they're not trying to be huge so like the rolling stones were never going to be the like you know they're never going to mick jagger's voice is great but it's not great like paul mccartney's voice you know like they don't do harmonies the way the beatles do they don't do complex stuff they're a rock and roll band and that's the thing they tried doing the hippie thing for a minute and then it, it failed so they went back to rock and roll. It's only rock and roll, but I like it. And they are just, they're old men singing so rock. So they're sticking, you know, they're sticking yeah. to one thread, is right. what you're saying. They're gonna, yeah. Well, I think I think the gene, like, so this is a really interesting discussion, right? And I actually, um, I would probably, you know, respectfully challenge. Please, what's, yeah. What, what is better? What is, like, what is... You know, I, I think it's a value judgment what you want to do with your business. I think it's right? just different. I don't think there's different. better. It's or different. Worse. But like what I think is the miracle of the, the really the thing I respect about Salesforce is they kept doing that strategy. Even at the beginning, I was sitting next to their creative director who was painting this no software uh, thing that they've created, which was sort of if you look up the history of Salesforce, they had this no software logo. And of course, they were selling software, they were just selling it in a new cloud based yeah, yeah. way. And so we like that was that positioned them as not just an alternative to uh, you know Siebel in the CRM, which is a very narrow space, but it really positioned them to create a new category at the time of software, yeah. right? Yeah, and that was at a company called software. Success Factors later, which you know was the one of the second or third like cloud original cloud pioneers. So we were borrowing that challenge, and so they created a new category. And then what I I think they are probably the, the real masters of, of, of hype to some degree, because whenever there is a new trend in the market, you know, Michael, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the CEO, um, Benioff, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> he kind of jumps on this trend. So if it's social, it's going to be social. Right. If it's yeah. AI right now, it's going to be AI. You know, it was, uh, you know, that you clo- clear the day about Slack. And, and I think there's just been like a, a very, very clear way where they would ride whatever is the new thing in the market without losing the essence to some degree, which is still being focused on the customer. I agree. Right? Like I think that that and I, that's actually really hard to do. I, I think I actually can do that. I actually not only do I are you not disagree. Like I agree with you in a huge way. 
And it's funny, not to beat a dead horse, but that's exactly what I'm about to do. The Beatles and Stones comparison is completely apt. Whatever your tastes are, the Beatles are the greatest rock band of all time. And the Beatles did everything. There's an argument to be made that they invented heavy metal with the song Helter Skelter. They invented soft rock with Yesterday. Mm. They invented um, psychedelic rock. They did it all. They were sales force. They were, they, their albums still outsell any band in the world. The Rolling Stones could have tried to be the Beatles. Everyone else tried to be the Beatles. Most of those bands don't exist anymore. I've seen interviews with Mick Jagger where he says the Beatles were the best. You know, we we can't, you know, we, we, we toured longer, but the Beatles were the Beatles. So what did they do? They became the anti-Beatles, you know, mm -hmm. they, they and they specialized in one thing, down, gritty, dirty, sexy rock and roll. That's all they do. You know what I mean? So they occupy that position and they kind of, they, it's sort of easier to execute. And we're not for everyone, If yeah, but there's yeah. enough people, you yeah. know, the Beatles, if the Beatles, if, if the Beatles were resurrected from the dead and they somehow did a reunion tour, it would be, the world would shut down. There'd be 6 million people at that concert. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Stones still fill every stadium on earth. There's mm -hmm. enough people who like down and dirty rock and roll, you know? That's great. So let's shift medium. So there's a there's a pretty famous avant-garde artist, right? Who uh, who we have his pictures probably in an average uh, average office right now. Tell us about his story. I think that's kind of that. So so people could start connecting like visual mediums, performance mediums. Um, Are you talking about Andy Warhol? I'm talking about Andy Warhol. Yeah. Right? Like um, a very fascinating story. Probably everybody uh, who loves art, you know, knows. Um, who he is, but you know, may introduce you know his story and what he was able to do with, and also talk about also his limitations and how he's created this enigma around him and those limitations. I think that's an amazing story from the book. I'm really obsessed with Andy Warhol because even though you described him as an avant-garde guard artist, and a lot of other people would too, and he always had a foot very firmly in that space. He's one of the few avant-garde artists who always celebrated and embraced commercialism in business. And they never kind of like went, they never butted heads. They always kind of meshed together. So something that, you know, he, he, he became big in the sixties, but he was already older. He was already middle-aged. And what people don't realize is that he was in the fifties, the biggest commercial illustrator in the country so he he I did um mm -hmm. yeah he he did i didn't talk about that in the book but he did drawings for this was before they did a lot of photography and magazines he did drawings for shoe companies etc 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 and he used a certain technique of blotted ink and um he uh he was rich but, but i mean he came from a very poor background he came from pittsburgh and by when he switched over to fine art, the reason he was able to do the galleries and all this, he had the money. I mean, he lived in a brownstone in, in Manhattan and the whole thing. And um, the way he made that happen, and I, I didn't talk, I, this didn't make the cut in the book. He was like the consummate Uber networker. Like he would always come in to, to the like commercial illustrators with his portfolio and he would keep an ear out for what like the secretary, which is what they called assistants at the time. Um, what like if she mentioned she liked a certain kind of bakery baked good she and he would bring it for them and things like that and so they always pushed him to the front of the line and then he used that later in his interview magazine you know but um the thing about him was he he was he was he was a misfit you know i mean he um didn't fit in very well in high school he had acne and very pale skin he started balding extremely early very very skinny and the other thing is he was gay. And, and in the 40s and 30s when he was, you know, when, or I guess the 40s when he was a kid, I mean, being gay was illegal. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was extremely um, put you on the outs in society. And what he did was, you know, we all, he figured, well, I don't know what was going on in his head, but the way I see it is, you know, a lot of us have the same strengths. I mean, there's a lot of good artists, right? But he said, well, okay, I've got these weaknesses not that they're not weaknesses, but these insecurities, these things that people consider weaknesses. Can I flip them? Can I find the strength buried in the weakness? So take his his balding head, right? He didn't just at 22 years old 
have the ring around the head and, and look like an older guy than he was. He got this glaringly obvious silver wig and he's still known for that. Right. Mm, his, yeah. his pale, his pale face. Um, he became like this creature of the night and being gay, he had this circle around him, which was very unusual at the time of very openly gay people of what at that time they called transvestites, which they now would call trans people, you know, and they would go with him into fancy restaurants and this and that. He never hit it and it made him a press curiosity. Um, his um, skinniness, he had a very distinctive clothing style that accentuated that, that ultimately like punk rock emulated, you know? And um, even the thing like, you know, artists weren't supposed to be commercial, right? Like before him, it was the abstract expressionist and they they lived in the cold water flats and it was all about being against the commercial society. And what did he do? He used his commercial background. He painted Campbell's soup cans. Mm -hmm. Like we take that now as like an obvious and, and celebrities. Now we think of that as, as the norm, but that's because he did that. And and artists hated him. They were like, "What are you? Are you an ad man? Are you part of the the bourgeoisie, as they called it?" Right? right. And and so the press would interview him. Oh, he was also very quiet. He was like shy, extremely shy, like socially anxious. So the press would interview him, and they would say, "Why are you painting soup cans?" And he would say in this quiet little voice, "Because I like soup." And they would pick apart what does he mean, this and that. And I think the lesson there is that, you know, a lot of us talk about this concept of personal brand and mm -hmm. we struggle so much with how to do that. And, you know, at its at its most garish form, you see all of these people there with their Lamborghinis that are usually rented, you know, and flashing the dollars and the thing. And despite the fact that it's, in my mind, a little bit annoying, it also is what everybody does. But what if instead you made a list of all of the things that you're insecure about? What if you feel yeah. that you're too much of a people pleaser? What if you feel that, um, you know, you um, steer away from conflict? What if you feel that you're not, that you're a shabby dresser and have never quite cracked it? And then what if you ask yourself, how can I creatively find the strength in that weakness? Like, look at Gary Vaynerchuk, who, you know, I've criticized in the past, but how did he make his name? It was with Wine Library TV. So what did he do? He happened to know wine because it was the family business. But before him, wine people were fancy. You know, they wore tuxedos yeah. and they speak about notes of elderberry. Now, yeah. he could have said to himself, oh, gosh, I'm really not suited for the family business. I'm, I'm from Queens and I have this strong, you know, he's from Belarus, but he grew up in Queens. And he, yeah, yeah. He the USSR. Strong, I can relate yeah, exactly. to him. <laughs> yeah. You know, he has this strong accent and he, he likes football and he's never shaves quite properly. He's got like a five yeah. o'clock shadow by two o'clock, you know, and he wears schlubby clothing. But he made that his thing. He became the wine guy for the everyman. He curses. He, he wears his flubby clothing on purpose he doesn't shave he says ah oh, you know this wine tastes like uh captain crunch you know instead of saying elderberry and now you have a whole market of people who identify with that and he's democratized wine and he made a multi-million dollar business out of that if you're thinking to yourself how can schlubby clothing ever be a strength well there you go it's a total strength for gary vaynerchuk the guy's worth millions and he still wears ten dollar jets sweatshirts so it sounds like it sounds like there's a mix of strategies that you're outlining, and and some of them are like look at what's in the market out there and kind of try to see where there are openings, right? Like to create a new a set of followers, a new kind of a, a new position for yourself, your service, etc. And then another one in parallel almost is like look inside yourself and find what either you already are or you, what you aspire to be, maybe what's truly authentic yeah. to you and kind of mix and match those two. Am I, am I kind of reading between the lines is kind of what, yeah, what yeah. or there's a lot more, uh, sure. There's a lot more to this, but no, it's sort of, sure. those are the two themes we covered so far. I think so. I mean, I think there, you kind of hit the nail on the head and right. So I think what that comes back to is that things are complicated, right? This idea that you can do, four sales funnels, a ticking clock, and a LinkedIn campaign, and that's going to get you business really doesn't work. I mean, all of this stuff is about human psychology. And some human psychology is how we react in groups. And some human psychology is how we respond internally. 
I mean, the way that I wrote the book and, and this was really an extension of how we've always done business is I read all kinds of stuff. You know, I, I read hundreds and hundreds of like biographies of, of, of what I call hype artists, whether they were cult leaders or rock managers or propaganda artists. I read papers on, um, you know, mass psychology. I, I read all kinds of stuff. Then I also, on top of that, was always doing experiments, both for our business and for our clients. And from all of that diverse range of stuff, I would see the same patterns repeat over and over again, different content, different mm -hmm. context. But some of the stuff was turning weaknesses into strengths over and over again. You know, some of the stuff was picking a fight or drawing a line in the sand. And so what I did was I, I to make it easier for people to, to digest, which is all we ever do when we're creating content, I, I uh, put it into categories. I saw the same 12 categories repeat over and over again, whether it was a religious cult or Richard Branson or Martin Luther King or the Rolling Stones manager or Alice Cooper I would see these same patterns repeat. So yeah, I mean, I, I really let the research guide the process and some are internal, some are external, some are a combination of both, some are about relationship building, but you see the same themes over and over again. So, so what are the themes you think, um, you know, particularly are relevant to folks that want to create an experience, right? The theme of the podcast is kind of how do we create the type of experiences um, could be digital, doesn't have to be, obviously, that, that kind of move our audiences together, right? Like, I think a lot of your characters in the book, like, kind of create an atmosphere, you know, they sometimes the, the, there was a physical component to, to what they were doing. How would you kind of uh, highlight some of the experience techniques and tactics that you've seen used successfully across these use cases? Not to evade the question, but I think in one way or another, they're all about creating experiences because I think that's what hype at its best is. What attracted me to this word hype and why I didn't steer away from it is because people think of hype as conning people. And if you're deceiving people, you're doing the wrong thing. That's just stealing. That's just conning people. What I think of hype in my definition is creating an experience. It's adding color to the world. It's drumming mm -hmm. up a lot of, it's like a carnival, right? So like, for example, the first strategy in the book is called make war, not love. And what that means is essentially being against ideas instead of for ideas. Well, isn't that what both Basecamp and the Rolling Stones did? They said to themselves, what is something in my corner of the universe that everyone takes as a given that I actually am against? Mm -hmm. um, another one is is quite uh, very directly experienced. It's theatricality, but theatricality mm -hmm. can mean creating a huge event where you worry about every detail and create an experience, or it can be the fact that I'm looking behind you right now, and I have no idea where you're sitting because you have this really cool 80s futuristic, you know, amazing, you know, what do they call it? Like vaporware background, which is really yeah. cool. And it says something about you. You know what I mean? It's like a new wave kind of background. It does. Should, should we have, should we uncover what's underneath? Should we, uh, should you just for it, the purposes of the audience? Yeah. Break, I mean, we sure. Break the fifth curtain. This so like exactly. So, so Right. So think about that. Okay. So it's a nice office, right? But the whiteboard you're saying something completely different with this staging versus the other staging. That was a conscious choice. And people think about these things like it's an after effect. So I have a totally different background, but you'll notice I have sound panels in the back. I chose to keep that because I have a little home studio here that we do podcasts in and I'm proofing on my back wall when I'm creating content, right? Um, you know, another one is build a secret society, which really, you wouldn't think that's experience, but that's the idea that if you make your growth seem grassroots, you always have to have well-placed people behind the scenes who can make things happen quickly for you. So let's say you're starting a piece of content. Well, you what people do wrong is they just put it out in the world and they just hope that the social media fairies will bring people to them. You know what I mean? Well, where are these people coming from? You have to be thinking of how do I nurture relationships with people who already have really big followings? Mm -hmm. who, will, who will be a champion of my content. If one person ch like that champions your content, you might pick up 10,000 listeners or readers in, in a week. So it's all of these things. It, it, the, 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 the point of hype is none of these details are superfluous. The idea is that the content itself is not enough. 
you can have the best work product in the world, the best business, the best product, the best articles. And without the theater, without all the rest of it, it doesn't go very far unless you're lucky. But who wants to who wants to count on luck? Yeah, this is this is so near dear to our heart. Uh, you know, I think we saw this biggest tragedy that like some of the more substantive, well thought out, um, more evidence ideas uh, that tackle the topics that are hugely relevant for the world, right, are communicated in arguably the worst possible uh -huh. way. Like they will it's why I'm in business. Yeah. It's to fix that. Because I would see it over and over again. I would see these amazing substantive things falling flat. And the people would always be like, oh, our stuff is so good. The cream will rise to the top. And then quite frankly, I would see empty garbage that wasn't saying anything, selling all this stuff. And I asked myself, is it because the empty garbage is better? And I would say, no, those people are just better. They, they've cracked the puzzle to communicate this stuff properly and, and drum up a lot of energy. And then I asked myself, well, can you do it for good stuff? And you can. Yes, absolutely. Just but people get their stuff. It's almost like their stuff is so good. It's like the classical musician who doesn't want to, to, you know, downgrade themselves by marketing themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. What about the classical musician who did, right? Yo, yo, ma. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, can, right. I mean, he's good, but I bet you there are better. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating. You're, it feels like you're a brother from another mother. It must be this man <laughs> had had connection because yeah. I, for us it's, it's so fascinating. And you're focusing on 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 the more kind of uh, storytelling component of this. Obviously, was 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 the agency. We're focusing a little bit more on the on the tactic, right? That kind of integrate various types of storytelling, various you know. But but I think they're aligned fundamentally because. Um, I agree. It, it's, it, you know, take, uh, you know, as your book actually points out, it's not like a one trick pony, right? There's different patterns, right? There's not different at all. Medium, you know, you, they're, they, you need to align them, but it's typically never, you never get to a great outcome with just one strategy. Like you said, it's a number of adjustments that, um, you know, a, a, you know, a powerful communicator that kind of gets their message across does versus just one one trick pony um, yeah, and the right tactics and the right and the right technology is a wonderful accelerator like there have been people who have used these strategies on papyrus you know i mean the aeneid the, the ancient poem was propaganda but it was real slow you know what i mean i mean it took a <laughs> long time for that stuff to get out into the world or christianity it took 300 years for that thing to get any traction scientology took 20 years and the next religion is going to take six months because the communication methods are so much more sophisticated now yeah well well let's let's talk about that obviously like couple relevant themes right like one is about you know the 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 ai driven spread uh you know uh another one probably one of the one of the founders of open ai that's not happy anymore is elon musk right who's like mm -hmm. spreading innovation yeah, you know, as we discussed last time, at um, unprecedented pace across different sectors. So let's let's like deconstruct maybe some of the folks that are not, maybe not in the book, right? That are kind of more recent, uh, more recent events. You know, what do you think is the kind of? Uh, let's focus on the on the obvious genius. Of what what Elon Musk did about you know some of his projects, um, and you know let's avoid the more controversial ones that are you know, maybe Twitter or others, but let's, let's pick where like everybody would be curious to understand what's your take on what did he do right with Tesla, yeah, for example. You know, with, with a lot of these super genius billionaires, when they become really big and they start making decisions that are questionable, sometimes it's because it's an effect where you think you're good, you're good in one area, that's less in one area that it'll extend to every area. And that'll like that Greek myth of Icarus flying too close to the sun and the wings melting. But maybe he knows what he's doing. You know, it's it's hard to say. But what I will say is that I think in some ways he's more of a hype genius than a genius genius. So, I mean, he didn't come up 
with the technology for Tesla, right? I mean, he bought that company. I think his contribution, which to this day, I think is so brilliant. Um, I remember a member of my family who, um, older person who's like an old hippie, had an electric car like 15 years ago called a Leaf. And it was ugly. And I was visiting them and I had to drive. It looked like a square. And I had to drive from Huntington Beach to Burbank. And I had to drive at exactly 50 miles an hour or, or below on the California freeway. So I was like looking for trucks to drive behind because the thing was going to die if I went any faster than that, you know? And so it was like only goofy hippies that drove those cars. They, they were, they, it was like a, it was like eating your broccoli. Like mm -hmm. you didn't do it because it was sexy or cool or fun. You did it because you were helping the environment and doing the right. right thing, but it was like taking your medicine. And what Elon Musk did that I think was so cool is he made the Tesla, which is, you know, an electric car, uh, ostensibly good for the environment, although there's doubt, but that was the idea. He made it good. It looks great, but also it was extremely expensive. Now, why would he price the car out of the range of normal people? Because the richest people bought it. Celebrities bought it. It became a status symbol. So then when he cre came up out with a version that was lower priced, everyone bought it. The same people who would have bought BMWs or Cadillacs in a different era or Mercedes now we're showing that that they've made it by buying a Tesla. It's no longer about, um, look at me, I'm such a good little environmentalist. People buy Teslas instead of Porsches now. Like that is brilliant. He basically got the world to consider electric cars, environmentalist cars, the ultimate status symbol. And that's just brilliant hype. I mean, it, I, I, it, it just seems like he planned that out like a chess game and it was like a 10 year strategy. That's amazing. Um, I think we we saw, you know, interesting coming back to Salesforce. So I, we saw the, almost the same pattern. So when I was at Salesforce, they were um, picking in each market size, right? Whether it's very large enterprises, very mid-sized enterprises, it's small enterprises, they're picking really well-known brands, right? So even if it's like a 20-person company, but it's going to be like a media brand uh, that everybody knew. And and then they would pick these sort of flagship brands. And, and it kind of created a sense for the rest of the market that the most innovative yeah, that's it. companies are, are doing this. So I then later worked with as a mar one of the first marketers uh, at Success Factors, and um, I kind of remember that hey Salesforce did this game, so we started you know really focusing on you know telling stories about the types of customers that we had that were really innovative, and we did we did a lot more kind of trying to kind of bring the story of of what we're doing for those organizations uh, to life, and then now in my own startup. You know, we we actually were very, you know, targetedly uh, started like as first uh, founding customers. We started working with Salesforce. We started working with Accenture, who in the B two B, at least world, are kind of the Disney Disneyland of B two B companies, right? Like they're kind of consumerizing B two B. So I think this is back to kind of examples of what you could be doing in in uh, B two B companies, right? Like it it it's or in a B two B world, this is a very tactical kind of leverage strategy, right? Who are your first followers will determine kind of what else happens with you in the market, right? Do you have other ideas like that, that, you know, um, marketers and people launching new uh, new solutions could use like product marketers and, and you know, folks that are, um, you know, maybe, you know, historically been too centric on, on product and not thinking through all the distribution steps. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the classic invite only approach is really good. You know, I mean, I, I know this was a consumer technology, but but I think it, it holds for B2B. The, what, you know, Facebook is now seen as like the old lady uh, social media platform. But if you remember what they did was you in the beginning, you had to go to an Ivy League school to be in Facebook. And then it was that you had to have a .edu. So you had to go to college and they kept expanding it outward until the quote unquote masses wanted to be like the Ivy League school. So I mean, one idea is you have this really sophisticated product with new features, 
what if you send a print invitation, a gold leaf invitation without telling anyone, inviting them to the unveiling and you keep it really vague, not of a product, but of a new development in the tech world. And you have a banquet and you have a whole thing and you have these people show up and you only give them access. And they're the only people in the world who have it. And you keep it kind of secretive. Word's going to get out. People gossip, right? And then you brought in it out a little and you brought in it out a little. It's that idea of a secret club that everyone wants to join, right? Everyone wants to be in the exclusive country club. Everyone wants to know what a Mormon temple looks like before it's consecrated. Here's a dirty little secret. It looks exactly the same once they put the blessing on it. But everyone will drive around to go see what it looks like before they close it off to the public. So there's sort of scarcity symbol, the 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 the, the sort of um, um, uh, the the exclusiveness. I, I you know I'm reminded of of uh, yeah, you know, and you've done all the research of you know of, of folks. Uh, so I'm reminded of Cialdini's uh, kind of work, right? Very, and, he he's uh, great, right? Yeah. right? And yeah. So maybe maybe kind of what one of the um, kind of benefits for folks that like once they read your book. You know what, 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 who, or what kind of literature influenced you, right? Like you've done all the legwork, I think, for somebody like me who is curious about this. We've always been kind of applying behavioral neuroscience uh, to our our products, uh, but you know, fundamentally, you you know, we didn't write the book yet on the on this. You've written the book. Who, who you know, who brings these ideas in a very concrete way from different disciplines? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and as a writer, I, I am a big reader in general. And um, it's funny, uh, the idea for the book, I, I can trace exactly where the idea came from. And it came from my relationship to another book. So I was reading this book called The Crowd by Gustave Le Bon. And it's an old book. It's it's French. It's it's not hard to read, you know. I mean, it's it's from 1898, but it was the first book of crowd psychology. This guy saw the Paris Commune basically burn Paris to the ground. And in the beginning, they had a reason for it, but by the end, they were just burning things for no reason. And and it he couldn't understand it. And so he just dug into how crowds behave. And it's amazing how much he got right. So I was on a business trip and I was like, it was at the end of the day and I was laying on top of the bed and Trump, it was when Trump, and I'm going to not tell my views about him politically, mm -hmm. but it, it was when he was going against 17 people and no one thought he would win. He was considered a joke. He was a game show mm -hmm. host, right? I mean, he was known mm -hmm. as the apprentice and a casino guy. Right. And especially where I live, you know, um, no one thought he would win and I didn't think he would win. And I was reading this book and it would say things like, I, you know that thing where you're like sort of flipping through a book and watching TV at the same time, not really paying mm -hmm. attention. And I was reading and it said things like um, crowds are huge followers of vague statements that are visual and tell, you know, vague declaratory sentences. And he's like, make mm -hmm. America great again. Make America great again. He said crowds um, are always for, you know, people who, you know, incite anger and pick fights they said crowds are always attracted to prestige when prestige is not available money is an excellent displays of money are an excellent substitute mm -hmm. and i'm watching this and i'm watching trump acting like no politician who's ever acted and i was like oh my gosh like this guy's gonna win you know mm -hmm. and i remember coming home to people and I was like I've been like reading this book and like this guy's doing all of the stuff and they're like God, come on give me a break and then he won and so like I I, I was kind of like so then I started really so this book The Crowd by Gustav Le Bon really kicked off my thinking I was like if this stuff it's that universal like this was mm -hmm. written before there was even radio mm -hmm. you know and yeah. now this guy is on television the biggest long shot victory in the history of American politics. And it's the same. It's like this guy predicted the thing. So I thought that was amazing. I mean, it's a really old book that a lot of people don't read. Um, then the books by Edward Bernays. He he was the, the, the father of PR, public relations. Mm -hmm. His books are also old, but they're made. He has one called Propaganda, which he saw as a positive thing. 
until he renamed it public relations after the war. So anyone who's in PR, you know what your industry was originally called. Um, and um, he, he has one called Crystallizing Public Opinion. There's a book called Pranksters by Kembrew McLeod, which is not in any way a business book, but it's about people who have used pranks to change history. Mm. That's a really great book. Um, there's a more recent book called Status and Culture, which is a lot it, it, that explains some of the stuff we were talking about with Tesla, how people always try subconsciously try to increase their status by latching on to arbitrary things that people in a higher status use. So the idea is that if someone is a millionaire and buys a $300,000 car without even knowing it, that becomes your aspirational status. And then you do it. And when they ever make one that you can buy for the price of a Nissan, then the people on the higher status are going to move on to something else because it'll become right gauche or cheesy. So that, I thought that was interesting. Um, but I, I, there's so many. That yeah. explains the tragedy of Burberry brand at some point in the United Kingdom, where it became, you know, a, a, all, all, all a, of it, you know, Gucci. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, all yeah, of it. Like, yeah, um, yeah. you know, uh, haircuts. He talks about he he going back to the Beatles. Since we're on that yeah. theme, he talks about he's like these things are arbitrary. He's like the Beatles got their haircuts, their bowl cuts based on these like these artsy people called they, they, they were these the exes these existentialists in germany mm -hmm. they came to the u.s and everyone thought it was crazy and it was corrupting the youth so then the youth started wearing it, it they became the highest status people in the world by the 70s everyone had hair that like like i remember i used to see the beatles and i and my mom would say that they have long hair and i would say you know they don't have long hair I mean, their hair was like to, to their ears, you know, because that was uh, like uh, all my friends had that haircut. Every little kid had that haircut in 1983. Yeah. So actually, it became mainstream, this thing that was so dangerous. And so it's that trickle down effect, right? So this is kind of related to status, but just to build on one thread, like one of the more interesting challenges that, you know, we see in spreading innovation and new ideas, in particular, that are important, right? Like, is if it's too new, um, and too radical, you know, and you kind of start yelling, we are going to revolutionize this, we're going to disrupt this. You know, it, sometimes those things don't work nearly as well. It's if, always as, number two. It's always it's, the second up to bat who yeah. makes all the money. The innovator doesn't make the money. Right. And so I think what the, you know, the, 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 what we see as the pattern is that you need to be novel, but yet familiar at the same time, right? To I think that's right. To reduce this risk of adaption. And, you know, we've definitely, you know, seen this in, you know, as marketers, we, we apply this in kind of how we think about, you know, developing products. What's your, what's, you know, what are you seeing people that are sort of, I'm trying to disrupt things, or I'm trying to create change, create something out of nothing, but how do I, you know, root it back to what people already know so that the change is not very scary? I, I talk about this a lot in the book, and, and what I say is, the, what, here's what hype artists do. If something is not actually that novel, if, if the amount of novelty is really small, that's when you have to make it flashy. So I use the example of uh, Simon Sinek, the uh, mm -hmm. sort of self-help business leader guy. Yeah, there's a lot of good things that can be said about him. Originality is not one of him. them. You know, he has this new book, The Infinite Game. It is a repackaged version of another book. And he even admits that. I mean, it, it, there's nothing original about it. Start with why there's nothing. Hey, love what you do. Have a reason for what you do. Nothing great. But he uses all kind of ear and eye candy. He talks about dopamine and epinephrine and circles and grids. And he just, he uses it, this scientific lingo to overcomplicate because that makes it seem like it has weight. When something truly is new, when something is new, it's scary. People don't like change, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they, they're, they're, your cortisol levels go up because in nature, sudden change is danger. So I, uh, religions do this. I, it's a strategy that they use this term, give the little babies their milk before you give them their meat. So mm -hmm. if you try to go up to someone and say, um, hey, I have something that's going to change your life. It's about aliens who live on the lip of a volcano who came down 20,000 years ago and implanted negative thoughts in your brain. You would call the mental ward. You know, you would call the police. Mm -hmm. But that's Scientology. 
but that's not how they do it. They start off with positive thinking stuff. They say, hey, you know, do this assessment. It looks just like a Myers-Briggs personality assessment. Oh, we can mm -hmm. help you out. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, read this book. Oh, it teaches you to define words that you don't understand. It teaches you betterment, personal growth. And then you get a little more into it and a little more into it and a little more. And before you know it, you're believing in aliens on the lip of a volcano. Whether that's mm -hmm. true or not, I don't know, you know, but I, it, it just, it, it, I, you know, it, it could be true. But every religion seems weird. Burning bushes, people coming back from the dead, people, you know, I mean, it's, I'm not saying any of it's true or false. I'm just saying it's all strange to someone who hasn't yeah. encountered it. It's all very novel. And so they ease you in. And that's because you have a threshold in your brain that can take tiny phases. So if you have small you know, steps, of small steps and wrap yeah. it in familiar yeah. wrapping paper. Right. So like yeah. if you look yeah. at Martin Luther King's speeches, what he did so effectively that. Honestly, modern progressives don't do very well at all is he wrapped what was a very radical idea for the United States. It shouldn't be, but it was, which was integration in the language of America. He talks about from sea to shining sea, glory, glory, hallelujah. We're going to deliver the promise of the Constitution. He wrapped it in language that, that Americans are very culturally familiar with versus overthrow, you know, like defund yeah. the police, the worst yeah. marketing, yeah. In, because people are comfortable with the police. Yeah. So what if now what if they had said, bring back, serve and protect? That would have been a much better approach. We need police who serve and protect the way they say they're going to do instead right. of dismantle all of the police. Well, that failed very badly. Amazing. So I think so. the, the language um, and the framing for the, the big important ideas of our time is that almost a um, you know, leading indicator of whether those ideas have, have heft, right? Like I think there's additional moments, but if the framing is wrong, right? Even though there's so much momentum you know, and, and, and support for some of those ideas from media or whatever other sources, if the idea is not packaged correctly, it will not stick. It's kind of you, like you, one you way. You got to get people way. to buy in. I mean, if you can yeah. do it by yourself, awesome. But if you need people to come along with the ride, which if, if you know, if you've created a brand new technology that has the power to change the world, but people don't understand it, I don't know, blockchain, I, I, I no one understands it. So everyone is talking about it. But there hasn't big a bit been a big innovation yet because no one it's not wrapped in reality. You know what I mean? Crypto is a little better because it's based on money, but even but that has some inherent problems, but people understand that better. The metaverse, we'll see what happens with Zuckerberg. I don't think people get it. Yeah. Facebook, they understood it was based on a freshman Facebook. When you go to college, you go to college and they have a Facebook. That's where that word comes from. It's a list of people that yeah. you can get to know. People got the, the metaverse. What, what, what is that? They're going to reinvent the world with cartoon characters? Like, we, no one gets it. And so one of the things that's gotten the wild adoption, we could have brought it up earlier, is, is the, the Chad GPT narrative, yeah. right? And how people are um, understanding the interface, right? The interface is simple enough. Um, where artificial intelligence, which we've been using all along through yeah. you know, various products, is now finally like more visible, more concrete, more identifiable. What what do you think is the secret behind this? Is it just that the technology came together, you know, with the right experience level uh, to make it work? We just launched our like chat that allows you to digest to your book. For example, if you have uploaded, you know, you could have a conversation with your book, you know, using the chat, right? Like, so we're, we're doing these things and people are loving it, but it was, you know, if we did this two years ago, uh, with a different interface, we, you know, I think it might not have worked nearly as well. So how do you, you know, interpret this technology's, you know, rapid adoption? You know, I'm watching and waiting. I, I don't know. And I, I, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but I'm not sure what's going to happen, right? I mean, is it really rapidly adopted or just people playing with it? That's what we need to know. Like, I remember when that Pokemon Go thing came out and everyone was saying, and everyone did it. And everyone was saying, alter, you know, AR, right? Like augmented reality was going to be, there weren't going to be video games anymore. Everything was going to be AR. 
And I have never seen, it was the weirdest thing. It was like cultural amnesia. Every single person I know did that thing for three weeks and then they never touched it again. And there's never been a popular AR thing since. So is chat GPT changing the world? Is it that good? Or is it, is it Pokemon Go? I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm not, this isn't my like hidden way of saying it's not going to soar. But I mean, I've given it some tasks and it, I, it didn't impress me that much. But I mean, I other people are saying it really impressed them. But also they've been talking about AI for 30 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's not really rapid adoption. I mean, there was that movie Lawnmower Man in like 1990 that was about virtual reality and robots that talk to you. And, you know, there was the, the Terminator and, you know, from 1984 and all of this stuff. So I think people, part of it is that it's a good tool, but part of it is people want it just like they want yeah. it to go to the moon. People find it exciting. They find it science yeah. fiction, you know? Yeah. But what are the use cases? Has anyone made a lot of money off it yet? Has it changed the world in any real way? I don't know. So I love, I love it. So for somebody who is a, a scholar of, uh, of hype, you're, you're remaining healthily skeptical. About I'm, healthily, new I'm healthily skeptical. Then again, I got it. I have to admit I walked into an Apple, uh, into a computer store when the first MacBooks came out, the new ones, you know, the ones when Steve Jobs came back. And I remember looking at my The ones friend, with translucent color. Yeah, the translucent say. color. And I remember yeah. saying to my friends, a friend I was with, I said, you know, that thing looks really cool, but it's never going to do well. And he said, why? And I said, it doesn't have a floppy drive. Like, how are you going to get your stuff off the computer, you know? So um, take what I say with a grain of salt when it comes to technology predictions. Well, Michael, I love this conversation. I love the richness of examples from all works of life and, uh, you know, arts and uh, music and um, visual uh, communications and business. Um, this has been super interesting uh, on a human level and an intellectual level and business level. Who would you recommend that we invite to have this type of exciting conversation on another episode of podcast who kind of inspired you um yeah and could in, is interested in some of the same topic there's a lot of people but there's one guy who comes to mind it's it's um a guy named uh blaine gray voice uh uh he um it's funny he was my cousin's best friend when they were like 13 and i was eight and i really looked up to them because they were badasses and they were like always being told by their teachers that they didn't live up to their potential. So the guy finally lived up his potential and he became this very successful video game entrepreneur. And he's done a million other kinds of businesses. He's like a really creative thinker, always on, on any new field that's that's happening. He's he's two two feet ahead of it. He's he's and also just an awesome guy. So he'd be great. Amazing. Well we'll we'll uh, we'll try we'll see if we can if he wants to join us. Uh, and, and, and if you Michael, need an introduction, I'm happy to make it. He, he's he's a friend of mine. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing, Michael. Well, listen, once again, uh, thank you. Um, you know, everybody do connect with Michael, uh, Microfame Media founder, the author of the Hype Handbook. Michael, what's the best way to get a hold of you if people want to uh, connect and learn more about what you can do for them? Well, yeah, all, all my information, if, if you go to the uh, form on uh, microfamemedia.com, uh, that's fame, F-A-M-E, microfamemedia.com, um, I'll, I'll see any email that comes through there. I make sure all the emails cross my desk. Um, the best way to find out about my ideas, though, really is to go to Amazon or wherever you get books and type in the Hype Hand book and, and check it out. And and if you um type my name, michaelfshine.com, into the URL, uh, that's my site, and that reaches me directly as well. Amazing. Well, I, can, for one, once again, want to endorse the book. I had a fun, I listened to the audiobook version, and I decided to listen to parts of it again because oh, thank I, I, I needed to, uh, uh, to digest some of those ideas, <laughs> and, which is a great sign. That this you. is a high-value book. So, Michael, thank you again. Delighted to have you on and hope uh, you... Uh, you connect with some of our audience members as well. Thanks, Alex. This was so much fun. I really appreciate it.